today to be in dialogue with Tyler Mitchell. Um, Tyler and I, this is the first time we're meeting IRL, as the kids say, in real life. Um, we will break down all the internet uh, acronyms for everyone. This is a, we want to make sure everyone's included. Um, we, I don't know, we kind of started talking in the before times a little bit, uh, but mostly ended up on Zoom. Yeah, so yeah. anyway, Tyler is um, a photographer, and his, one of the reasons I'm so interested in his work is um, he sort of exemplifies something about his generation that I'm really interested in, um, which is that he doesn't particularly make like that much distinction between what, what my generation used to call commercial work and fine art photography. And those of you who know me know that I'm always interested in sidestepping any boundary line like that that makes one art form you know, better or more valuable than another art form. Like I'm always not interested in those kinds of distinctions. Um, and so usually here we do art and craft and I, I won't allow that distinction to stand. So it became really interesting to me that Tyler and some of his um, generational artistic cohorts weren't making that distinction um, in their photographic work and in their video work that um, my generation had inherited and sort of just we held on to that distinction. So he's done, you can see Tyler's work in a variety of places. He's done perhaps most famously um, two covers for Vogue, one, uh, some people you might know, Beyonce and Kamala Harris. It's, it's like easy stuff. Um, no, nothing overdetermined about those two people. And he's also, um, you know, shot ad campaigns for luxury brands. But he also had a, a show at the International Center for Photography called I Can Make You Feel Good. Uh, and there's a book out uh, with the same title. And then also one of the things I love the most about what you did during the pandemic was um, Tyler organized a kind of online... I don't know, movie gathering, night. Movie, movie night, night. movie night, um, where he showed, you know, shorts and features and art films and, you know, regular films and commercial films and people would chat, you know, in the comments, um, they would just sort of float up along the side and there was something so tender about it in the, at the height of the pandemic when it really did seem like, whoa, like these people are serious, we're just going to be inside all the time, <laughs> you know, um, you you created a space where people could gather, um, and it was just really it was there was something so tender, and that was also called "I Can Make You Feel Good," and it did. It made me feel good. So you delivered on the promise of the work, and that's always a good thing. Um, so I've prepared some questions for Tyler. He doesn't know what questions I'm going to ask him. But since they're all about him and his work, everyone can be calm. He knows the answers. <laughs> um, okay, so you ready? I think so. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, we also went to the rodeo last night, and it was Tyler's first rodeo. It was a great time. <laughs> we did. It was really sweet. I was telling my wife this morning that it was all these moments where Tyler just would turn to me and go, this is wild. <laughs> I'd be like, yep, this is some wild shit. Um, so anyway, and I'm very hopeful that the cowboy who got thrown off that bull last night is okay if anybody was there. So a cowboy got real, he got trampled under a bull pretty bad last night. So, all right. One of my, I'm embarrassed to admit this publicly, one of my favorite um, radio programs is um, a radio program hosted by this woman named Krista Tippett, and it's called On Being. Okay. And it's like a kind of like what I would call soft spirit, you know, like soft spirituality, you know, how to think, like how to be your best self, you know, all that kind of jazz. And I totally listen to it. I'm sure I'm her target audience, like, you know, 55-year-old white woman living in a major city struggling to make sense of it all. Boom, I'm there. Um, and one of the questions she asks all of her um, members, or the people who come on her program, is what was the spiritual backdrop of their childhood? 
And it's a really interesting question. And it usually reveals interesting things about the subject. And I wanted to see if I could just turn it a little bit and ask you, um, what was the cultural backdrop of your childhood? Like, did you go to museums? Did, what movies did you, did you read magazines? Yeah. Were you a library kid? Were you going to concerts? Like, what, how, what was happening in your childhood that got you to be here on this stage right now? Yeah, um, I should also thank you for having me and should zoom out and thank the ranch and you know all the people who have had me. I was here in May um, for two weeks doing a residency, so it's nice to see the relationship deepening and our first IRL meeting <laughs> to be happening. Um, yeah, um, cultural backdrop. It's a really good question because I consider myself probably a bit of a culture junkie. Mm -hmm. um, and it started really early on with my father um, exposing me to art house movies. Um, so I do say a lot that I kind of started or considered myself a filmmaker first, um, purely by accident and by loving movies first. So my dad would drag me to art house theaters in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, yeah. all right. Um, he would drag me to art house theaters. We'd watch murder mysteries and Alfred Hitchcock movies and stuff that I think a lot of kids in school like weren't being exposed to at that time and also stuff my mom probably didn't want me to see. <laughs> um, but it was a big, we were a big movie household. Mm. Um, we weren't so much a museum and gallery household mm -hmm. and nobody in my family uh, culturally was, was artistic. Um, or kind of came from an arts background. So my dad just was a movie junkie. So those were my first like memories of seeing images and being like, I, I love that, you know, I wanna make that, I wanna do that. So it's funny, like, it's exciting to me now starting to, I suppose, grow roots in a, cer a certain sort of institutional or museum or art world uh, space. Um, I sh certainly have memories, right, of going to the High Museum of Art in Atlanta and seeing, uh, um, the Amazing Quilts by G's Bend Ladies right. in the South and thinking, you know, aesthetically identifying those at a young age as objects that were made by black women. I remember that, but mainly movies. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I, I grew up watching music videos by people like Khalil Joseph, who, you know, runs the Underground Museum. Um, I grew up kind of watching uh, all the murder mysteries I could get my hands on. And then I followed the yellow brick road, so to speak, up to New York um, to study film at NYU. So, but like you're, you're saying, you kind of introduced me as someone who crosses boundaries or thinks about boundaries and image making very fluidly. I think it's true because I was a bit of a culture junkie. I was a library kid and a, and a museum kid. I was reading mythologies and all sorts of things growing up in school. But I, I also kind of, my first instrument of making images had a video mode and a photo mode. The DSLR camera sort and of And when had. did you get that? How young are you when you get that camera? I was 13, mm -hmm. so um, I remember I was also taking up skateboarding. So a big thing going on as well as movies was, you know, the internet and Tumblr and sort of skate culture was becoming prevalent and mm -hmm. prominent. And so skateboarding doesn't seem like a portal into creativity, but it kind of is because there's a whole art form behind the filmmaking of the sport. Um, Spike Jones mm -hmm. actually, you know, made a lot of amazing skate films, William Strobeck. And so there are these famous like filmers in the skate world that I kind of aspired to be as well. So I was taking up skateboarding um, and kids started to know me as this kid with the DSLR who was the, oh, that's the skate filmmaker guy. And right. so that was, that's the uh, cultural backdrop, so to speak. That's really interesting that, um, that you've got like this mashup of Hitchcock, who's such a brilliant composer of images, mm. Guy's Bend, mm. you get your color and your fabric, mm. and then skateboarding, you've got the, that ineffable, the community, that so ineffable speak, thing that kids do when they get together and make their own world. Mm. What kinds of images were you taking of your skateboarding um, cohort at the time? Were you, was it more video, more film? How did you share it with people? I remember I made a, I was always making montages. Like mm -hmm. I was always um, 
recording friends, and I remember I was like always color, super into the color correction process of the footage that I brought home at the end of the day. And I remember I submitted a video I made to a competition of sorts for a skateboard magazine called Trans World Magazine. So they had a filmmaker-oriented competition where they said, mm -hmm. we want to look at the art of filmmaking of the sport of skateboarding, and we want to award some of the most interesting stylistic filmmakers you know, with some money, but it was also like a feature in the magazine and so on and so forth. And I submitted, I remember I was too young to submit, actually. I had to be like 18 and up, and I was like 16 or something. But they were like, wow, this is really good. They reached out separately and were like, we can't give you this, but this is really good. You should oh, wow. keep going. Mm -hmm. And so I was like... That, so I, I remember these montages, basically, that were very, like, almost kind of candy-colored and stylized, and probably bad <laughs> now that I look back at them. But, right. Yeah. Well, maybe not bad. Maybe just young. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you get this little bit of encouragement. Were you encouraged by your family as well? Did your father see the effect he had had on you? Or was he like, young man, I'd like you to become a banker? <laughs> <laughs> um both, I think, <laughs> at the same time, because I think the worry for any parent is, you know, how are you going to make money from this, and how are you going to live, and uh, I mean, he was constantly badgering me with those questions, right. <laughs> but they also trusted. They said, he seems to know where he wants to go. I said, no, I want to go to to NYU for film. I really want to, to move to New York. I really want to go to a film school, um, so I applied to, I mean, not just NYU, but I applied to Howard. I applied right. to all sorts of film Mm -hmm. programs, you know, AJ, Arthur Jeff was in right. the kind of film program at, at Howard, but um, ended up in New York, and then it was about trust. Right. They didn't know what I was doing, maybe until, you know, more prominent sort of photographic commissions happened, but right. they trusted. So that's well, good. that's really good. I'm glad to hear that. Mm. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your process, about this move from filmmaking to photography, because there is something really cinematic about some of your pictures. Um, not all of them, but some of them really seem to imply a, a narrative that may have just happened outside the frame, or some of them have a kind of, I don't know, like a sweeping lushness. Mm. Like I always think of the one of the, the blue sheet on the laundry line and you can see the shadows of the young men behind the sheet and it always reminds me of Terrence Malick mm -hmm. for some reason this kind of like very romantic very lush sensual landscape even though it's like super you know straightforward it's right. like two guys behind a sheet on a laundry line and right. somehow it has the magic of film so I wonder if you could or something like this for instance you know where the implied movement of the hula hoop is so strong so I wonder if you could just tell us about the process. How does the setup go? Like, how do you find your subjects? Yeah. And then how do you get in a position with either that young woman or uh, this is looks like a self-portrait, is it? It's not. It's, it's not. not. Look at you <laughs> finding someone who has your body type. <laughs> um, well, we can talk about that, too. Um, but how do you get these um, this incredible sense of movement and your figures and all of it. How does it work? Um, I kind of am still trying to figure that out, but the way that I try and articulate it is um, I really encourage, you know, all the, over the years I've been photographing people that I sort of meet online actually on Instagram and I kind of cast by looking for interesting faces. I think this feels more like common practice now than it did when I started it f even five years ago, but I think so much connection and connectivity is happening online that you're finding characters that you're drawn to on Instagram or someone whose just style you're drawn to or face or story or background seems interesting. And so most of these people are either kind of casted that way or they're friends or they're friends of friends in New York or any of the various cities that they're made in. Um, so, for example, that, that sort of that motion and that movement, I think it's about once I've found these characters that I'm really interested by... Um, going to a location that I'm really interested by and just trying to bring a certain sort of recipe together mm. or ingredients together and, and leaving the actual moment up to cer a certain amount of chance. Mm -hmm. So um, like even the image just before this one, which was the five boys kind of lined up in Walthamstow, um, that was an image I made in London, England, and it was, it, again, as you mentioned, I blend doing a lot of sort of commercial and fashion work with doing personal work. 
And so that was, I was in London doing a, a commissioned, uh, I was doing a commissioned assignment, but I, that was a personal picture that I did the day after, and it was, you know, I just asked my friend who was casting, do you have any friends that are interesting or intriguing in London that I could photograph tomorrow? I really want to go to a marsh, maybe I go to Walthamstow Marshes, the trees there, they remind me of Georgia, even though I'm in London, they remind me of home. And so I just start to respond to environments and respond to people, and then we, we play on the day. Mm. And it's kind of, it, they are all staged, they are all constructed. You know, this is a very specific idea that came to me in my head about this idea of ice cream sort of dropping down onto the lens, almost like sensuously or yeah. sort of kind of, uh, but playfully as well and naively. So. They're either direct ideas that I come up with or they're sort of, I bring the ingredients and then leave the, the recipe to chance of making the picture. And when you say leave the recipe to chance, does that mean that you're in dialogue with the f people that you're photographing and talking to them? Is it, is it um, collaborative? Do you give them like direction, like a movie director? Or is it more like, we're going to do this together? What's the vibe? It's like a complicit collaboration. Uh -huh. And it's a team effort as well, right? Because I sort of look around and I bring, so like, I often have some friends that come with me and we'll go to the, we, this was in a park in Brooklyn, and we'll say, that's a really nice spot to do like a, a laundry line setup. And oh, like, and all my friends, they kind of know what I like as well. Mm -hmm. So we, they kind of, we all have like our little toolkits of blue sheets or of, <laughs> Kit or of like kites and uh -huh. butterflies and we're like oh that's really fun and we'll just try that and so we 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 do that and then we kind of with the model or the subject or the or a friend of ours it's about a collaboration and I think that that's something I talk about a little bit um I think like in the specifically in the realm of fashion I think um image makers or, or any photography sometimes with staging things it can become very prescriptive between the photographer holding power or kind of um, domain over where the subject should lay their arm or, or position their body. And so I try to release that a little bit. This was a, another good example, a uh, serendipity moment where I thought I was actually going to photograph this model, um, a Wang, um, in the sand, right? Mm. Above, ab above her, maybe she'd be laying down. And then she got up from the sand and I said, that's right. kind of amazing, just kind of formed a heart on your back, just, just actually just stay right there. And so the moment actually became the moment after what I thought the moment was going to be. Right. And so I'm kind of looking for a certain sort of happy accident, always. That's really interesting. I wonder if in that back and forth, like you have a little bit of an idea, some people know what you like, you've got a blue sheet in your bag. Um, I mean, this is a perfect image to really stage my next question. I'm really curious about the tension in the pictures between color and composition. Like sometimes um, they seem like so equal sometimes. Like I'm curious how, what your thought process is about that. Cause you get really like modernist, classic modernist compositions like those hula hoopers in a grid or even underneath the hula hoops, like old, like, you know, kind of Maholinage, you know, like those big sharp angles and all that drama. But then the color pop is so um, you you just work with such saturated colors. And I like what what happens in that mix for you? Yeah, I feel like I'm maybe always. That's a really good point. I think Lyle Ash and Harris also pointed out like there's a like I never thought about it before, but he's like there's a real formal rigor to your work that I don't think you even know is happening that is, is very, like you said, it's, it's bringing in the classic. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, the compositions themselves are sometimes very straightforward, or they're very kind of like legible in, in how they're laying out information. But hopefully I, I subconsciously am bringing like a certain youthful freshness with the right. color choices of props, or whether that's this orange hula hoop that dissects the frame, or that makes her eye travel. It's, it's a certain blend of old and new that I'm kind of right. going for. Does that and make sense? It does. It does. I like the idea that you're associating, in a way, the composition with the uh, historical lineage and color with your emerging oh, usefulness is actually a, a, a kind of wonderful way to think about it. Because, of course, in these images where you do have this strong modernist compositional style, those pictures would have been in black, mostly were in black and white, exactly. right? So the pop of color 
does seem um, striking in that regard. And most of the pictures I sort of look at and love are black and white pictures. Oh, so that okay. maybe shows it's maybe that shows itself a bit. But you don't shoot in black and white, do you? Why not? No. Not sure. Just think <laughs> in color. Yeah, you I, think. I, I actually I actually do know why, but I just think like you're saying, mm -hmm. it is about bringing that mixture. I think like I get so into sort of black and white photography works by people like Gordon Parks or Roy de Carava. Um, who were also sort of photographing, you know, black families or black life in a certain sort of sensuous and rich and heightened way. But I think about what would those sorts of pictures look like now, and I just think they look, they're, they're in color. You know, mm. they sort of bring a new sort of palette to them, so. Mm. I wonder if we can talk about, um, I mean, your work is doing, operating on so many levels, but I think one of the things that's been so arresting about them and so transformative um, in how we're, we're all, I think, as a country, as citizens, as we try to um, reckon with this history of our country, which is pretty, you know, it's a little rough around the edges. Um, but one could totally look at these pictures and think about them, and again, this is like kind of perfect for the question I'm gonna ask. There seems to be a through line in the work about black masculinity. Mm. And it's not the black masculinity that I grew up with. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly not the black masculinity my parents grew up with. And I just, I wonder like, is that conscious? Is it a concern? What, how does it inform your image making when you're thinking about a black male body? Yeah, I think, um that's one of the maybe more central facets mm -hmm. that the work's about. Um, I think uh, on one level you could kind of theorize about certain subsects of black masculinity or you could kind of theorize about um, ideas around masculinity and what genre to maybe put this work in or other works in and I think one big part of that, and I think I definitely do think about those things, but one big part of when I'm making these images um, is that I'm simply trying to tap into sort of how I moved through space in Georgia growing up, mm -hmm. how my masculinity or my way of being, you know, could hopefully encourage other folks to, to embrace other sides of themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it, it's also just a personal, like it's also just a personal relationship to masculinity mm -hmm. that I don't think I try and like, overtly say this is this is the right way to be uh, move through the world as a black man or this is the wrong way to be i think this is one way to be you know whether that's like enjoying ice cream or or you know flying kites or mm. whatever it is but i think um i think that i try and lead with the personal and then i also do acknowledge that there's a certain like new language emerging in photography um that is that a lot of photographers are considering like we have new language around gender. We have right. new language around sexual orientation now that has exploded in the last uh, four or five years. That even, you know, when I was making a, I remember I was making a series of images for Marc Jacobs um, that had men in women's clothing uh, right. and men wearing purses. There was a lot more outrage then about those images than there would be now. Right. And so uh, you have to think about, I'm sure other photographers have made images similar generations prior, you know, um, that received a similar outrage. So we right. just have to keep pushing the narrative. And so I just think as long as I tap into personally how I express myself and, and continue to make that, I'm being true to something. Mm. I mean, for me, I have to say the work feels like profoundly feminist in that way. Like there's literally not a trace of toxic ma masculinity in your work. <laughs> like, and I have looked for it, <laughs> you know? Like, I, wanted, I didn't want to get on stage with you and, and, you know, be able to have someone, you know, DM me and show me a picture where... But it really, like, the touch between men is very tender. The bodies tend not to be, um, like, hypertrophied, you know, like, super like almost parodic about a certain version of masculinity. Um, there's not like, kind of like, I don't know, 90s and 2000s rap video kind of, you know, like a whole thug life genre. Like all, you, it's just like you've, and, it, and nothing seems 
like this about it. It's just like you've just like stepped to the left or something. And I don't know if that's intentional either. I think it's, again, via personal experience. I think it's trying to tap into moments where my mom, you know, was questioning, questioning the hoodie that I was wearing out the house, you know, for example, or thinking about dress or thinking about ways to dress, you know? So I think, mm -hmm. like, um, I think that, um, you know, none of those genres or none of those ways of being are sort of wrong in a way. I think there was another friend of mine who brought, like, a certain sort of, like, queer reading to mm -hmm. the work and said, well, this is, this, th these images feel very queer in a sense. And I, I kind of like that the narrative within the works is, is sort of like, I was talking to Amy Sherald about this actually, that uh, there's a certain openness in the characters that in these works that I hope allow people to bring a certain, like hula hooping isn't something that I do on a daily basis. So it's like, I couldn't really get up here and say, well, these works are about hula hooping directly, <laughs> but actually looking into the narratives and the feelings underneath the hula hooping, so right. to speak, give you that sense of openness or that sense of freedom or that sense of self enjoyment that clearly these subjects are having, right? Like right. they're having a good time in the picture. You feel that. I'm having a good time making the picture. Hopefully you feel that, you know, and so hopefully the viewer is having a good time looking at the picture. Mm. Um, that's, that's and I mean, since I can make you feel good is a, a phrase that has sort of moved around your work right. um, and it has a couple different iterations. Um, I mean, it's a, I don't know really how to ask this question. It wasn't like a super feel good year. And yet, you, you know, and yet, your images don't feel forced in their feel goodness, you know. I mean, they don't feel Pollyanna-ish. Um, I'm curious how you're able to tack toward that good feeling in the midst of like a lot of complicated feelings. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that is a hard question to answer. <laughs> um, I guess I wonder about. Well, it's it's interesting that you mentioned even the movie night. Um, which I almost see as a sort of extension of my practice in a way now. It's become one. Because it was designed as a, as a program, as a part of my museum show at the ICP. I wanted to open up the museum overnight, and I wanted to play movies that I liked oh, I on the that. screen uh -huh. of, of one of my video works. And so, Like it, in a sleepover kind of situation? Yes, exactly. Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. And so that program was one way of activating the exhibition, but obviously the exhibition closed, right? So... Um, then I thought, well, let's just make a website and let's do it online anyway. And so it formed this community. It also became this, like you said, mismatch of multiple genres of filmmaking that I liked, that I was drawn to from people like Khalil Joseph to Arthur Jaffa to Paris, Texas to E.T. To, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And so I think um, I maybe have gotten off track here, but I think, you know, to answer the question, I don't know. I just, I just kind of try and get lead with that, that right. sort of a, that sort of a feeling. And also the book itself, even though it, it sort of came out last year, it's a, it's a compendium of work I've made over the past five years. And so one conversation, there were so many sort of interviews or conversations over the last year, people trying to figure out where to go or how to feel, or where to go from here about the complicated feelings uh, of the last year. Right. And uh, the easiest way that I kind of think about where my work fits in that sort of kaleidoscope is that it's it's sort of of the moment but not made specifically to the moment if that makes mm. sense like mm. and so it is um yeah does that answer your question a little bit it does I think it's hard I mean it's hard to know how any of us um navigate you know what is hard about the world and what is cruel and what is unfair about it and art's often been a place where you know, people have permission to ex explore their own mind, the fullness of their own mind for its own sake. Um, and people, that means that sometimes art is very much of its time and sometimes it can be kind of not of its time. And I don't know, your work feels to me totally made of this moment as as well as it's refusing some of this moment. And I, I guess that's, when I think about your work and I look at your work, I'm, as a historian, I wonder like how 20 years from now when someone writes the big essay on like 20 years of your work, like how are they gonna mark, um, 
you know, the, the way you're a generation that emerged in the wake of Trayvon Martin and yes. lived through a global pandemic and blurred the boundaries between commercial and fine art photography and made this body of work. You know, like, I don't have the answers to that, but I'm, I like, I'm already waiting for that essay. So am I. <laughs> let's, let's, I think time will tell, like, time will right. tell, and there's no point in rushing it. And also, um, you know, one thing I also spoke about with Amy that was very, like, revelatory and that I keep with me was, like, I think a lot of, I think my work maybe functions, uh, like you said, it takes a, a step to the left or a sort of refusal of the moment in a way just because I think um, we talked about the way that so many artists feel this certain need to bring the, his bring the historical or bring the traumatic or bring a certain struggle into their work. And I think Amy and I are, are both interested in asking the questions, when do we rest, right? Or when do we kind of enjoy the work that we're making or when do we kind of luxuriate in you know, allowing ourselves to kind of make these cer these certain narratives that I'm making in my pictures. So she does the same in her paintings. Um, we had an amazing conversation that really pointed out a lot to me about what I may be doing subconsciously. So, right. And you share you share with Amy. You're both colorists of a pretty uh, significant S order. Specific. Yeah. So, all right. I've got I've got like a few more questions for you. One is. And this, people have been trying to answer the question I'm about to ask you forever, but your shit is cool. I don't know if it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> what does cool mean to you? Like, I mean, like, I mean, maybe not the image of the firefighters, which has an earnestness in it, but like, there are a lot of pictures you've made where you're like, wow, that's a cool picture. If I were, if I were in high school, I'd have like ripped it out of the magazine, ticked it up on my bulletin board, like I want that, right? So what's the role of cool in your, in your work, especially as you move in and out of fashion and art spaces, which are kind of defined by cool and help to produce cool? I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Yeah, no, I, I don't have any sort of answer for that. Because um, you, first of all, you're the first person to ever ask me that. But also, <laughs> this, like, this idea for cool of cool for me is is really continuing to tap into the personal, it, and I know that I know that that maybe I've said that a couple times in this conversation, but there is no like I think as the moment you start to consider cool as a formula or as something that you sort of make or something that you sort of do or something that you kind of or you're told is cool, it's immediately uncool. Does that, that make sense? That is one of the problems with cool. Yes. <laughs> So I, I just don't know if I think of anything I do as cool because I, right. Do you know what I mean? I do, I do. But I also I'm not you, so I can I know that I have the subject position that can identify you as cool. Like I get I get that privilege in life. Um, maybe another way to come at the question is, um, could you talk a little bit about the difference between fashion and style? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think also to your point about fashion and art and fashion and style, like fa fashion is very uh, brazenly sort of like upfront obsessed with whether something looks good or not, right? right? Whether, you know, so like there is that always in the, I always kind of think of beauty and whether that's like, there, there are certain like things that just work. There are like wrong answers to making pictures sometimes or things that sort of, or even to making videos or films. Like there are sort of wrong and right answers about uh, sort of standards of beauty in the image making, in composition, and things like that. And you could almost consider some of those techniques, like once you know those rules, there are ways to break them, right. which are good. But um, I think knowing certain rules of, fashion or style or beauty in image making has become an interesting way to hook, hook people in for me into like other ideas I'm thinking about. But the difference between fashion and style might be considered in today's world, you know, fashion becomes this sort of two-dimensional, right, way of, mm. way, way, of, way of wearing clothes where style becomes some sort of other thing, three-dimensional sort of thing. That's how I think of it at least, where style becomes about who brings what they're wearing alive, so right. to speak, you know, right. maybe in a conventional way. You know, you mentioned um, Arthur Jaffa, who's a great artist and filmmaker. And 
um, who typically goes by AJ, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to revert to AJ now. And AJ talks a lot about, uh, he's talked publicly about um, black people and style. style. Right. You know, like that, that, you know, part of black visual culture is style. And I wondered, you know, as we look at these pictures of these very, you know, beautiful, young, live bodies in these gorgeous pictures, like, is there something in specific about black style, black gesture that that you're amplifying or or creating that you think about? I'm just curious if you're, do you roll with AJ on the like, you know, black people, you know, they work their style thing pretty hard. Yeah, I mean, you like, yes, basically yeah. in short, yes. AJ like also talks about like virtuosity, right? right. And sort of the way, um, I, I, I love his, his theory around like, you know, uh, to score a, a point in basketball, you just have to put the ball in the hoop. But black people, we don't just put the ball in the hoop. We do a 360 and then we put it through our legs right. and then we dunk it in the hoop, you <laughs> right. know, which I love <laughs> this idea. Right. So I think like there's, it's undeniable if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be making work in collaboration, right, in sort of complicity with these folks, that their gestures and the way that the way that we all live is going to come alive in the pictures. So it's not even something that I question or, or, or force. You right. Know? It's just going to be there. It's like when I start to see the way people move on set, I start to re react to it. And mm. I start to then think, yeah, we need to run with this kite or we need to. And so it's, all, it's like bringing, it's a blending of, of again, of, of, of the person I'm photographing and my own sensibilities. You know? Right. Before I open it up to the audience, is there anything you wish I would have asked you or you thought I was going to ask you that you prepared for, but, and now you got like all these answers in your head and... No, no. You, you asked me things I didn't think you were going to ask, which excites me, <laughs> which I'm happy about. That's good. Oh, before I turn it over to everybody, though, I just wanted to ask you one more thing, because, um, because you are um, part of an emerging generation of makers. Who are your people? Like, who, who do you look to? I mean, you've name-dropped Amy Sherrill, Khalil Joseph. Who, who do you look to? Who do you see yourself in dialogue with? And they could, that could be your... your your people now, your people your age, or, or Gordon Parks. I know you're very invested in that material, but, but like, who, who's your posse? Who are your people? Yeah, I love that question. Um, the posse, I hope, is like very vast. <laughs> <laughs> like, I even, I'm obsessed with this uh, ceramicist, Zizifo Poswa. Oh, Do mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, it's not like necessarily directly correlated, but I love what she's doing. Like, and right. I talk to her all the time, you know. Right. Um, she's in South Africa and she makes ceramics, she makes, you know, pots and vessels that are based on portraiture. So mm. I'm like, that's really that's cool. interesting, you know? Mm -hmm. And like Khalil, obviously one of my people who is making, he's, he's now the head of a news bureau, right? right. But it's an, art, it's an art piece as well. And, mm -hmm. it's, and so black news is so amazingly kind of interdisciplinary. I think I'm just fascinated by people who are not afraid to sort of cross over into, into a couple different things and whether they're looking at photography and then making ceramics from it or whether they're looking at music videos and making movies from it or whether they're, you know, all those people sort of interest me. So Dina Lawson, she's sort of playing on a certain family narrative that I love. Um, Carrie James Marshall, mm. Khalil Joseph, AJ, um, but also young folks. You know, I think um, there's someone na that nobody knows named Justin Solomon who is in St. Louis making mm. like amazing pictures and cool. yeah I think I could I could probably do this for like 30 minutes if you want me to but <laughs> we shouldn't go there all right well thank <laughs> you I want to turn it over to the audience now if anybody has questions for Tyler and we're going to pass a mic around okay so that way we can get you on the uh on the interwebs and then Hi, Tyler. I'm Julie Ratner. I'm actually a commercial art consultant, so I loved hearing all of this. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My question is about social media. I see that you have over 400,000 followers on Instagram. Yeah. It's a lot of people. And you're young. <laughs> How does social media affect your creativity? 
you know, when you get 30,000 likes, is that putting you in a direction, creative-wise? Oh, that's wise? a good question. Or you have 300 comments, and then you get feedback. This is something that we didn't have 10 years ago. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, go to uh, UCLA and learn under Kathy Opie or go to <laughs> Yale or I didn't, I didn't have formal critiques. Basically, is what I'm saying. Sorry. Oh, you are a Tish. I didn't have formal critiques. I went to NYU for film, but I have to say, like, the film critiques were not good. I, unfortunately, I have like, I have criticisms. But I think that it, I think that I didn't have rigorous formal critiques, basically. And so the most rigorous formal critique I had was social media, which is, which is uh, both. I, I I realized the double-edged sword that that statement is sort of right. You know, it comes with good and bad. So, um, yes, I do pay attention to it. I think it would be it would be like it would be sort of lying to everyone in the room if I said, oh, I'm unaware of some sort of audience or that I didn't grow up aware of a certain sort of audience. I mean, I grew up on Tumblr where there is an awareness of sort of a community and, a, and an audience and an, and, an, and, a, and an ego as well, so to speak, you know. So I am aware of those things, but I think what's become fun about hopefully the future and just what I'm making again is that I try and toe this line of like, being aware of it, but again, delving into the personal and um, sort of ignoring it on a certain level now. Like I think, um, I feel lucky to be in a position where I feel able to have fun, you know, <laughs> if that makes sense. And I, f and I feel able to sort of create without worries about numbers or specific how things are, you know, it's not like a business where there are metrics behind it, it's just about what I like. Hi, um, I'm Noelle. Thanks for speaking. It was really nourishing hearing you talk about your work. I was really excited that you were speaking. I guess I don't really have a question. Uh, well, I think I would just be interested in hearing you talk more about, uh, well, okay, let me back up. So I had this, one of the best studio visits I've ever had was with Jonathan Gonzalez, and we just talked for a long time, and one of the things that they said to me that really stuck out, because I feel like I'm always like texting my friends or like, talking to my friends about things I'm doing, and they said, um, they were like the first person to ever tell me, like, I think that conversations with people that you trust and respect and love uh, is such a form of research, and I feel like when you were speaking about the conversation with Amy and like finding that place of rest, and I think especially over the pandemic, there were so many moments where you, I was reminded that it's the people that I'm making work with and talking to and collaborating with, and like that's the research. And I think I really enjoyed hearing you talk about just like working with your friends, because I'm like, yeah, that's the whole thing, right? Like that's what I want to do. And I just wanted to hear you talk more about that softness that comes out of doing that, because that's not something you can plan. That's something that happens when you trust people that you're working with and surround yourself with people that you love. And like that research becomes a lot more fluid. And I don't know. I think that like that's where the softness in your work to me like comes out is because like yeah. Sorry. I feel like I just have a lot to say. I yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, I love that you pointed that out. Basically, <laughs> I think you said it. Like, I think um, uh, I say a lot that come again, having had no formal critique and sort of like, I think maybe that is something that I sometimes feel I'm lacking, right? Like, I don't have like a group to sit around in my studio and what do we all think about this and how do we feel? So, I think uh, conversations have become the main way that I sort of think about the next idea or get inspired, you know? So actually the pandemic was really deprived. Like, I don't know if other artists feel like that, but I have to admit that by not having just day-to-day -day conversations about how we're feeling about the weather or how we're feeling about like the colors outside or we're just walking around looking at buildings or, 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 or bigger, more important political issues or anything, like being basically deprived of those for like a year was really tough. 
<laughs> you know, so it, it, it ba- have, not having critiques and just coming off of 14 months of having fewer conversations creatively made me realize, like you just said, how valuable that is to my practice. Um, and probably a lot of other artists would say the same. Um, I'm Ava, and I guess I just have like a question in general. If you could choose your favorite like piece or draw uh, photo you've taken, what would it be? It's hard, isn't it? <laughs> um, I I don't know. It change it changes every day. But I'll give you an answer for today, I guess. An answer for today is um, a a. A new image I've made, which is annoying because I can't show it here or anything like that, but it's a new picture I've made in Georgia. I've been making a lot of work in Georgia and thinking about Georgia, and um, there's an image I've made by a riverside that I really love today and that I'm thinking about a lot today, so that's my favorite picture. What was it like for you to watch um, all those Confederate statues come down in the South? I was... Oh, oh wow. Yeah. I... Uh, so, like, Stone Mountain is something I grew up going to, you know? And, like, it's now a place that I've been wanting to make a project around for a long time. I know Kara Walker has made an amazing project. What is it? Um, to Hell or Atlanta First? or what? I forget what it's called. So I think there's, like, lots of thinking to be done about, like, Confederate sort of monuments. And, I mean... What am I supposed to say other than I'm happy to see these things being coming down? You know what I mean? Like I don't know what to say other than like, it's. <laughs> I'm happy on one level, but it's also confusing, right? Because what like, like uh, there's also a certain sort of like uh, acknowledgement of like those monuments being there is like no, that is the place that this that is this history of this place. You know, <laughs> like stone the stone mountain rock being erected is like that is a part of this sort of confusing, complicated place called the South, you know? So, um, yeah, that, that might be like a, an hour long answer actually, now that I think about it. Yep. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, it is confusing. I too am very glad they came down, but I also wonder, what does the action speak? Yes, like, exactly. You know? And like, what are we wiping away or washing away or what are we sort of trying to get rid of? And like, I like that Kara's work is, you know, you talk about one of my people, maybe she's one of mine, I don't know. Like, I just think she's, that amazing commission she did for the Tate, um, which was like, you know, riffing on the Buckingham Palace kind of monument, but also saying, here is all the complicated history behind these monuments. And I'm not, I'm I'm going to confront you with it, is such an amazing uh, thing, you know. To just take them away doesn't really have the conversation. My name's Kara, too. Oh, <laughs> I'm curious how you reconcile between the commercial asks and what you would like to do artistically, because I can imagine that they'd like to have a say-so, and it took a while for them to trust you entirely. So how do you, how do you go about that? Um, <laughs> all sorts of uh, tactics. <laughs> no, I mean, really, like, the best tactic is honesty about what you're trying to make immediately up front. I'm like, look, I'm, I- I'm interested in making these sorts of things. And I've been lucky enough to have doors opened for me to make those sorts of things at uh, commercial scales, you know, at, at, wi- at large scale, at, at, at big scales. Um, yeah. And... Um, yeah, honestly, the, there, there is, it's, it's a larger uh, question than just me, right? Because there's also a generational moment happening, there's a cultural moment happening in photography, there's a shift in what we are, what the, what the ask is of photographers doing commercial work. The shift has become more towards leaning into their voice, right? Rather than asking for something ex- based on execution of a certain style or assignment that's predetermined. So I think like photographers are basically being um, asked to to give their personal voice into these commercial works and to sort of let their voice shine. Um, So I'm seeing that with a lot of other young people and it's not just me. Uh, Yeah. Anyone else? Um, I actually have a a question if that's okay. 
Um, thank you so much for being here. Your work is incredible. It's so inspiring. Um, I just want you to speak a bit to the experience you had with Kamala Harris shooting for Vogue. Um, I want you to talk about, if, if that's OK, um, kind of like the reaction to the photos that you staged. And first of all, like how you staged them, what your thought process was in terms of her outfit, um, just the total aesthetic of the photo, and what the community reaction was to that at such a high stakes moment in our time. May I interrupt just for a second? Does everyone kind of know the story? Kamala Harris, cover of Vogue, she's wearing sneakers, internet went crazy over them. Because she wasn't in a gown, she didn't have her like kind of glamorous Michelle Obama moment on the cover. There you go. Yes. Happy to be honest about this. Um, I mean, I'll start by saying I'm very proud of the pictures. I'm very proud of being asked to make those pictures. And, you know, that's a huge ask. Um, huge, huge ask. Yeah. And, uh, Can I pause you for a second? I mean, like, you get the call. Like, what, like, do you hang up the phone? What, like, what, just, just let's start there. Like, what's that moment? If no one in this room has been called to say, like, hi, I'd like you to shoot the first black vice president of our country for Vogue? Uh, I think I just danced around my studio a little bit, <laughs> to be honest, okay. to be totally honest. Um, no, but I was also like uh, immediately thinking about the implications, right, which are heavy. And uh, I mean, to the, the full honesty of the, of the experience was that she's an amazing collaborator um, and that she, uh, there was a real, there was a real dynamic. There was a really good rapport, um, but also that. Um, so the photo session itself went great, um, and we all know about the sort of reaction. Um, she chose to wear to wear that outfit, you know. So a lot of the choices behind those photographs were hers. Mm. Some were mine, but it was a it was a collaboration. So the outfit was her choice, and so that is how she wanted to look on on the cover and. That's, that's sort of the, 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 the story behind it. I mean, I think like looking back from it years from now or like the thing about like time or like internet reactions to anything or like any of those sort of things is that like 20 years from now, I'll know how I feel about those images. Do you know what I mean? I, it, it, right. It's not really important to me how the internet reacts to something in a moment because I've seen outrage. I've seen, posit I've seen overwhelming positivity for things that I no longer care about. So, um, in making those images, I'm like extremely proud, mm. extremely happy that there's a black woman in that position, and um, extremely happy to have connected with her, and mm. that's, that's that. Um, I too really love the image, and I love the image because she was wearing sneakers, um, and I thought like, that to me looks like a lady about to go to work, and there is a lot of work to do. So I was, I loved the, um, I think one of the, Participants mentioned softness, and there was, she seemed so, like such a badass, and yet the, the, the gesture was sort of soft, and it was really beautiful. So, and that is why I'm so happy to have been in conversation with you, and so happy that you're making work, and um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.